the power of Castle Hate Skull, I am Hellamar Carly, and this is another episode of Haters Will Say with Hellamar Carly, okay? We're not going to switch it up on you and bring in another host and defy the whole logic of this podcast, which is me talking to you because you like hearing me talk, okay? I will never switch that up on you. Thank you to everyone who's been voting for me on all these podcast award uh, competitions this recent one for last week's episode, Best Dressed Podcaster of October 2021. I really appreciate it, okay? Um, I just keep it simple. You know, people go, Mark, is that like a $100 white shirt that you're wearing? No, it's just a fresh, clean tee, okay, from Fresh Clean Tees. One of my little life ha hacks is I, I order these in three packs, and they come every month, and I wear them once and then just throw them out, okay? But that's how I keep looking fresh. There's not a stain on here, all right? It's so bright. I mean, maybe you're blinded if you're watching on YouTube. I apologize for that. But what I'm not going to do is apologize for looking fantastic when I podcast because that's important to me. A lot of guys will show up, you know, haven't showered, haven't shaved, haven't done their hair, wearing a dirty stained shirt. Not me. I got my fresh clean tea and I'm ready to rock this mother effer. Okay. So let me just say today, um, we have another banger of an episode, but we might get a little more serious this time than in previous episodes. I'll still make jokes about the serious stuff because that's the kind of person I am and that's the kind of person I hope you are too. On this week's A Sup Fool, we're gonna talk about what's up with the bodybuilding industry because, oof, a lot of people have been dying. Former Olympia champion, Mr. Olympia, Sean Roden, passed away recently. Um, he's not the only one. There has been a spate of deaths. John Meadows, who is a little bit older, but I believe still in his 40s, is a, he's a legend in the fitness industry. Cali Muscles, very lean, very muscular, and, and having heart attacks in his 40s. It could be attributed to something else, but you know, within the, the pattern of this heart attack, heart attack, heart attack, heart attack. Uh, George the Bull Peterson, a classic physique, competitor, uh, elite bodybuilder passed away last month as well. So even in just the space of like two months, the sort of buzz online in the bodybuilding community is all these people are dying. Duh. What bodybuilders do at the elite levels is dangerous. And it's an extension of what, uh, you know, any of the dangers are for anybody taking anabolics at, at any level, right? Uh, when you take anabolics and growth hormone, you are incurring risks. Steroids make all your muscles grow, including your heart. Growth hormone makes all your organs grow, not just your muscles. So you are inviting left ventricular hypertrophy, which can be uh, uh, dangerous for you. You don't want an enlarged heart. Steroids can put stress on your liver, especially oral steroids, your kidneys, uh, all this organ stress, all the, the stress that you get simply from being a heavier person pursuing the natural or enhanced limit uh, of the amount of muscle that your body can even handle, it puts stress on everything. You know, the, the difference between, I like to run, I, I can tell 10 pounds, you know, uh, that I gain or lose makes a huge difference on my ability to perform cardiovascularly, for instance, because you are, you know, carrying around this weight. If you're at 230 and you go up, up, go up to 240, it's like you're carrying around an extra 10 pound weight in your hand. Um, your, your heart has to work harder to put mu a blood to all those, that new muscle tissue. So the thing that I would just try to say on this topic is because people are going, what can we do to change bodybuilding? You can't. It's an inherently dangerous and sort of silly pursuit. You know, uh, <laughs> a bunch of guys, you know, now it's hard work, but the end goal is to look like a freaky gigantic monster on stage with as much muscle mass as possible at the lowest body fat percentage. That's cool if you can parlay it into something else, but you know, if you can make it to your 30s or 40s and you're still cranking these huge amounts of gear, which are necessary to be a top bodybuilder, even if you take time off, you still have to go, you know, take ungodly amounts, you know, and I've made this comparison before. It's like, you know, if TRT is a shot of alcohol, the, the amount of steroids that pros are taking at the elite level would be like whacking down a 30 pack every night. Okay. Um, in addition to other unhealthy practices, like, uh, dehydrating yourself before a competition, it's just not healthy. And I would 
advise you to look at all these uh, recent deaths and think about that. If you've ever thought about doing steroids, just know that you are incurring some level of risk. And now you can mitigate that risk with various practices. Um, you know, number one, minimum effective dose, right? If you're going to take anything, do the least amount possible that's going to give you any result, right? And only work up uh, when you have absolutely maxed that out. Speaking of minimum effective dose, mitigating risks, um, I'm going to use that as a transition into another segment of Hella Sick Fitness Pages. This week, I am highlighting a guy named Vigorous Steve. He's a Dutch bodybuilder who lives in Thailand. I had the pleasure of discovering his YouTube channel um, earlier this year. And this guy is such a great resource, um, specifically on PEDs. I would say he's probably the best resource uh, as far as information on PEDs on YouTube. He gives it to you straight. He goes into the pharmacology. He goes into the dosing protocols. He's a coach who's helped hundreds, if not, you know, a thousand or more clients in their competitions and use strategies that that I think are the best strategies, like minimum effective dose. He has videos on micronutrients, on macronutrients, on fasting. Uh, he follows his journey. He actually got alcohol, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease recently and went completely off steroids and fix that problem with fasting, with a fasting mimicking diet, and all these types of things that um, put his body back into a healthy state. And it was interesting to see him like go off, lose some size, and, and come back on on very small doses and get it all back. So that's another thing that I think, you know, speaking about open bodybuilders and guys who get addicted to steroids, essentially, you can become addicted to the size and never want to get off because you're scared of you know, getting smaller. Well, this is a guy who who shows you, yeah, you can go off and lose some size and maybe you don't work out and it'll come back, you know, on, on a minimum effective dose. So he's somebody who I'm always referring his videos to people. Like when people come to me with uh, basic questions, I'm like, here's his video on beginner steroid cycles. It's going to give you everything you need to know, you know, starting with bioidentical compounds and the right doses, testosterone, growth hormone, insulin, uh, and moving from there to the, say, if you're going to take that journey, you can do it the safest way possible by following Vigorous Steve's protocol. And he's got a dope-ass voice and a cool accent. And he lives in Thailand, which is super cool, post videos himself training in Thailand at crazy gyms like you've never seen before. So check him out. If you don't, I'm going to check up on you. And if you guys aren't following Vigorous Steve, by the end of next week, I'm going to hunt you down. I'm going to dox you, and I'm going to smash that follow button for you on your phone. How would you like that? <laughs> I'm going to introduce a new segment today called Deep Ass Thoughts, where I think about stuff in a super deep way and then communicate those thoughts to you. So a guy named Uncle Bronco's Barbecue said, Hey, Mark, I'm just a normal nobody, but I wanted to say you and the Thick Boy crew are awesome. I know, right? <laughs> I'm a fat guy trying to get fit and lose weight to be healthy for my wife and kids. I love how positive you are. I do too. I'm definitely not a hater, just a dude you inspire. Now, a lot of people might be thinking, oh, Mark, you're just reading these nice messages to stroke yourself off. And yeah, there's an element of that. I love stroking myself off, but it's not just about stroking myself off. I want to stroke myself off for my audience. I said, thank you for writing, my friend. Appreciate the feedback. Wish you the best on your weight loss journey. Let me know if you have any specific questions, which I always do if you reach out. I'm going to be like, hey, give me a question. You know, this isn't just about, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I know I'm so great, right? This little message led me to think about how, uh, you know, men will, men will write me and say things like, I'm doing it for my wife and kids or some extra. No, those are all very noble goals, right? To get fit for your family, to get, uh, to get in shape, even if you're just pursuing women, right? You're going, I, I, want, I want more options dating women and I'm a young man or an old guy, whatever you are. It's a, if you're improving your physique for something external like that, that's awesome. You should do that if you want more successful outcomes in the dating world or just, you know, to have your wife more attracted to you or to have, uh, you know, to make sure you're around for your wife and kids. But the deep ass thought here is that's how it starts, right? It starts with this, I'm going to work out to get this. But what ends up happening is you fall in love with the process. And you also fall in love with pursuing 
excellence, right, in the context of fitness, but you start to see that, oh yes, exertion feels good. In the most basic ways, we see that exertion feels good uh, with exercising, lifting and running and doing any sort of high intensity activity. And I think that just carries over to everything else, right? We, we start out as men saying, I'm gonna do this to get that. But ideally, you'll fall in love with the process and pursuing excellence and self-improvement. And then it's about you because I don't think I could sustain uh, lifting weights if it was just about being ripped. I mean, that's great. Yes, I work out, I get ripped. It's whatever. But if it was just about looking in the mirror and I didn't enjoy the process, wouldn't do it. Mm. And I say that as somebody who hates to do many things and can barely motivate myself to do some basic tasks that I just don't feel inherent enjoyment. I know I should do them. Oh, I'm going to like the outcome, right? But the moment it starts to feel like homework or something, I'm out. Never liked homework. But here I am, mom, <laughs> you know? The teacher said I'd have to do homework to succeed in life. But here I am with almost three and a half thousand followers on YouTube. Wrap that, wrap that number around your brain and then wrap your brain around that number so it can be intertwined with one another. It's just unbelievable where I've come as a guy who didn't like homework growing up. So get that chick, get ripped, get pussy, and then all of a sudden you're not going to be a pussy and you'll get even more pussy. Boy, you're in store for a real treat today because we have another episode of Mark Harley's Bro Science Academy. So today I wanted to talk about a principle in lifting that mm, maybe it works better for actual hypertrophy, maybe it doesn't, but it's more of a psychological trick for me. It's doing your workout in reverse. I do this with any muscle group, but specifically with legs, I'll use this as an example. When you start with squats or leg press or these compound movements, that are super tough, right? By the time you get down to like doing calves, hamstring curls, leg extensions, some of these auxiliary isolation movements, um, I'll not want to do them. I'll be like, fuck this shit. Fuck leg extensions, I'm going home, right? You're not as motivated. You don't, you don't want to put 100% effort into it. Or sometimes just knowing like, oh, I gotta hit a PR today, you know, or I did this much last time, going your heaviest in squats or deadlifts or something right at the beginning of the workout can make you put it off, right? So that's another psychological phenomenon that we go like, oh, you know, why do people not like to do legs? Because it starts with squats, <laughs> right? Or it starts with heavy hack squats or heavy leg press, right? And I like doing legs, but it's not fun. There's a reason people hate leg day because squat sucks makes a, you know, squats make you feel like you want to die if you're going to failure. So my hack is start with leg extensions, right? That essentially serves as a warm-up. Um, and it's easy to go all out to failure on leg extensions, you know, as the first thing. It's not that, it's not that uh, intimidating and it's not that difficult. It's not gonna get you huffing and puffing and feeling like you wanna pass out. So you do that, you do your hamstring curls. Um, by the time you get to squats, you don't even have to use that much weight to get the same level of uh, fatigue and exertion. So you don't have to use the same weight, you know, if I'm normally repping four or five on squats, I can drop down to 315 at the end of a workout, and it's the same level of exertion I'm using, right? And then the real benefit is on that last set to failure or whatever, on a DC program, let's say I'm doing a 20 rep hack squat to failure, on that last rep, I get to be like, peace leg day, I'm getting the fuck out of here. It's been real, it's been fun. Wouldn't say it's been real fun. You can do that with anything. You can do take a chest day and do flies first, do the isolation movements first and save the compounds for last just to switch it up. Is there a benefit to hypertrophy? Potentially. Um, it's just kind of an old school bodybuilding technique to pre-exhaust. You know, you could do flies right before you do a bench press. You could do leg extensions right before you do a squat. Um, try it out, especially on lagging body parts, okay? You know, it's the great Missy Elliott once said, you put your thing down, flip it, and reverse it. So I want you to put that workout down, flip it, and reverse it. And let me know how it goes, all right? Thanks. Ladies and gents, we are back in the kitchen with another Hella Chef Harley, bringing you all my favorite recipes, the high-protein recipes, the delicious recipes, the recipes that are going to help you go from fat to really shredded overnight. I guarantee it. Just send in your money now. For the low, low cost of $1,000, I can show you how to eat and not be fat. What we're doing here today is protein pancakes. Again, super simple. I'm selecting these recipes not based on like, oh, it's so complicated and you have to have all these things in place to eat healthy. No, these are like two ingredient things. You're gonna mix a cup of Kodiak cakes, right? Available at any store, Ralph's, Costco, whatever. You can get the bigger one from Costco. This is from Ralph's. 
PE Science, another company that doesn't sponsor me but needs to get on the goddamn ball because I'm consuming your products, okay? I'm promoting your products. What are you doing for me? Nothing? Great. Let's rectify that. PE Science makes a great whey casing blend in this specific uh, flavor, cake pop. Now, I've tried other flavors of other proteins. It just doesn't work the same way. Cake pop goes with Kodiak. Um, it's perfect. It actually makes these pancakes taste better. Like, I, you know, if you try them, the Kodiak cakes without the protein, and then you add the protein, you're like, oh, it tastes better. It tastes more like cake. Who would have thought, right? So you take a cup of this, two scoops of this, uh, mix water, right? This recipe is just, you won't even notice it. I put in vanilla almond milk sometimes, but you mix that up. Makes like four to five medium to large pancakes. Put some of this sugar-free syrup, or um, this is monk fruit sweetened syrup. This is like 20 calories per two tablespoons. This is 15 calories for two tablespoons. You don't eat a lot and actually eat them uh, without syrup a lot of times, and they still taste amazing. If you mix those up with water, what you're going to get is uh, a meal that will fill you up legitimately. Like I eat this and I'm full in the morning. Um, it is 620 calories, okay? 64 grams of carbohydrates, six grams of fat, and 76 grams of protein. Incredible. You can heighten that even more with a little milk, a little eggs, whatever you want to add in there. It'll, it'll only taste better. I guarantee it. I wanted to tell you a little story. I was going to bring in some finished pancakes, actually. I made a batch last night, had them in the, in the refrigerator. But then in the, in the middle of the night, um, I got up to get some water, and the pancakes were calling to me. They're like, Mark, come eat me. I'm like, no, I can't. I have to bring them on the show tomorrow. They're like, but I want to be eaten now. And I'm like, I don't want to be rude to the pancakes, you know? I don't want to just ignore the pancakes. I'm a nice, respectful person. So when a pancake is telling me, please eat me now, don't wait until the morning, don't do it on the show, sure. I'm going to give the pancakes what they want to get in my face and go down my stomach and come out uh, probably some point tomorrow. They were cold. I put them in the microwave for like 30 seconds. Oh, my God, they tasted amazing, fluffy, great, and filling, okay? And let that be a lesson, too. If you have healthy things in your fridge and you want a midnight snack, oh, my God, it's not so bad. Oh, no, I ate 40 grams of protein in the middle of the night. Who gives a shit? Me, because that's helping me get buff, so I care about the protein, okay? Be like me. Eat midnight snacks that are healthy. Got it? Do it. All right. I have a quick lot of people been asking me. Guy messaged me yesterday. His name is Bryce Whitehill. He said, looking for some advice from the buffest man on Instagram. Well, that's me. If you're looking for the buffest man on Instagram, you found him if you're watching this YouTube page. If you think you found him and you're on someone else's YouTube page right now, well, you're wrong. You didn't find him. Maybe you found number two or number three or some guy who's not even in the top 10, which is really embarrassing for you but I'm here. I just moved back home and started to have my little brother work out with me. I could tell he is self-conscious about his size. He's in eighth grade and is a pretty big kid, 5'10", 260. We've been doing bodyweight exercises with one mile fast walk jog, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and 30 minutes fast walk, Tuesday, Thursday. I don't want to push him too hard or he hates it, but also want to see some results long-term. So any advice for an appropriate routine? This question resonated with me because it, speaks on something that is an important aspect of my philosophy, which is, yes, don't push too hard. If somebody's already feeling bad about their own weight, right, you don't need to do this biggest loser, shame them into, you know, wanting to kill themselves because they're fat, uh, you know, and yell at them as, as, a, as a motivator. It makes great TV, but it doesn't really make good, long-term, uh, sustainable motivation. So I wrote to him, I think that that all sounds fantastic. And the real key, as you mentioned, is to not push too hard. He should enjoy the level of exertion and be introduced to progressive overload in a way that will make sense and be inherently enjoyable to him. One concept to introduce might be Tabata, which we've talked about before. Anything that can help him get in the daily habit of exercise and allow him to see that it doesn't need to be long and torturous in order to be effective. That's one of my main philosophies is like, if you're in eighth grade, you shouldn't be working out for two hours. You shouldn't be seeing it as a punishment. You can introduce it to such a way to a young kid or an older person who doesn't have the, have the experience working out. Introduce it incrementally. If you also get people to go, oh, we did this much yesterday. Look at what we can do this week, right? Uh, you bench this or you can do 10 push-ups before. Now you're at 12. When people latch on to that, that's, real, that's the real key to longevity 
and, and being committed long-term. If you enjoy improving, you're gonna stick with it. If you're just looking for the results, eh, another external motivation that it's only gonna last so long. You're only gonna be so motivated to wake up and be like, I need a six pack today, I need a six pack. But if, because you're not gonna see it that fast, you know, you're not gonna see the changes on a daily basis, but every workout, if you can improve one thing, man, humans are hardwired to love that shit, to improve a little bit, get a little bit better, you know, beat their score from last time. It's why video games are so popular. All these games that we play, it's about beating yourself and competing, you know, with yourself or others. So this eighth grader, right? Same principle as, as you know, getting your mom into working out. You, you start wherever you're at, make it fun. Don't try to kill them. Do not try to kill your clients. Do not try to kill people with exercise. That is bad. You shouldn't do it. I'm saying it right here, right now as a legal and medical disclaimer. Do not try to kill your mom with exercise. Just make her cry a little. All right, we got another saucy or not today with uh, Sam W. Chart, a follower, a fan of the show, who wrote in with pictures of himself. Another dude sending me shirtless pics, huh? Classic. So the first pictures we're going to see, the guy looks really skinny. So I'm assuming this is at the start of his transformation. He's 15. He has visible abs, and they're actually quite prominent, but his arms are very long. He looks like a huge bobblehead. His head's way bigger than his body. I'm not saying that as a diss. It's just a fact. Uh, he looks really ectomorphic and skinny, but I can tell he has a nice frame on him. Now, if you were just to look at this picture that I'm looking at uh, of the start of his journey to his most muscular, where he's putting his arms up like this and doing one of these, which the skinny guys look really good doing, um, you'd be like, yeah, he's on juice. His lats look wide. Um, he looks like he has some vascularity even in his lats. Uh, his arms look much more developed. Um, his chest looks bigger, you know, his abs look, well, they were defined before, but I guess it just, in comparison to his torso, uh, his waist looks even smaller now that he's developed his lats, right? If this were like a, tw you know, this guy were like a 30-something or a 20-something going, I went from here to here, my first instinct would be to say, yeah, you're juicing for sure. Now, this guy could be, but really it's a lesson to me on what can happen when you start lifting during puberty, right? If you start lifting at 14 or 15 and actually commit for 18 months or two years or whatever, you can make drastic changes. Now, this guy, as, as I said in the first pick, as a 15-year-old, he looks sort of gangly and goofy. But when you look a little closer, it's like, yeah, he has abs. He has actually some muscle on his shoulder. He has broad shoulders, which can kind of make you look skinny and weird when you're young um, and you haven't quite gone through puberty yet. But that makes for a more dramatic physique when you put some muscle on it, when you have long limbs and you put muscle on it, when you have broad shoulders and you put muscle on your shoulders and chest, uh, it can look really incredible. So it's more just like a, a note on when skinny guys get buff, it looks amazing. And when fat guys get really skinny, sure, that can look great too. I'm just saying with ectomorphs, you can see everything. If you keep that same body fat percentage and put on muscle and go from a gangly teen to you know, a muscular teen, as, as your body's pumping all those natural hormones into itself, uh, that's a great time to take advantage of it. So part of me thinks that, yeah, he could be taking SARMs or something like that, but at the same time, this kind of transformation is within the realm of possibilities. I was a freshman at like 116 by senior year, I was 220. Without that, you know, I still had a six pack. Um, it was just a lot of eating and lifting and growing into my frame. So that can happen and it's a great time for anybody who's young, do it now, way, way easier than doing it later on when life hits you in the dick. Okay, we got a hater of the week. As I referenced before, this one's like a little bit sad. I wanted to share it with you again. I'll rack up these hater of the weeks, like, you know, a plan for to do one or the other. Some of them are goofier, more lighthearted. This one just happened yesterday and I felt like it was a good teaching opportunity, even though it's a little bit dark, frankly. I feel like it's another sort of, example of something that validates my premise and I think something that we can learn from, okay? Unofficial Sweat is his name. Commenting on multiple pics of mine, stop the fucking duck face. Enough with the duck face. And I post that like, a, you know, if somebody's just like posting repetitive stupid shit, I'll, I'll, you know, screenshot it and post my story. My caption was the, I'm confused by my feelings for you starter pack, which is like guys always, duck face, duck face. I'm not making duck face. I just have gigantic juicy lips. Get over it. He writes back, because I tag him on it, and goes, thanks for the free publicity, you insecure duck face idiot. And I said, you won't get a single follow. You'll just look like a fucking idiot. You sought me out to criticize me for making a face I'm not making because my lips trigger you. 
who's insecure. Thank you for allowing a complete stranger to enter your world because you're an insecure little bitch. I said, this is what I do. Thank you for being yet another insecure young man who's triggered by my appearance because they hate themselves. You are now my content. Um, wouldn't that be convenient for you? It's not only convenient, it's an objective truth. Keep living in your insecure bubble of assumptions, Hark Marley. And I say, so in your world, searching for another man on IG who doesn't know you um, to comment negatively on his appearance makes one seem confident? Oh yeah, Mark, that's it. You hit the nail on the head. And it goes on and on like that. And I go like, seriously, like, how do you think your behavior seems to the outside world? So I'm gonna have to summarize a little bit because it went on and on. And basically I posted a screenshot of, <laughs> he has a link to his rap album on Spotify. I posted it and it was like, this song, I didn't even listen to this like songs and say like, this sucks. It was just like, I hate myself, like themes of self-loathing. And it just validated my premise of like, here's the kind of guys who come and attack me online. People who are making rap songs about hating themselves. Uh. Now, because I posted that, some of my followers messaged him to tell him his music sucks. Now, I'm not gonna tell you one way or another to not do that. I don't encourage bullying, but it's like, hey man, you made a decision to come at me publicly. I'm just sort of, as I do, it's like, and here's this person. I'm not saying attack him or look how much he sucks at music. I think it's awesome that anybody tries anything artistically, but if I put that out there and you're like, I tricked you and I'm gonna get free publicity, and then people tell you that your music sucks, well, that's a consequence of your action, putting that negativity out there. I woke up this morning to a bunch of messages and voice notes from him on Instagram, basically like expressing remorse. And at first I was like, is this guy joking around? Um, but he was like, really like, actually sad and said, you know, you taught me a lesson today. A lot of your followers messaged me. Like, it really put me in a dark place. Yeah, you're right. Like, of course I'm jealous of you. You have 50,000 followers, you, this and that. Like, I'm a nobody, this and that. I, I thought I was being funny. Basically conceded every point, right? That, like, yes, I'm jealous. Yes, I'm insecure. Yes, I don't like myself. He went on to talk about how he like injured his back and can't lift anymore and is in a really dark place and said something that resonated with me that it's hard to be nice to people when you're really unhappy. It's true. And, and he said, you know, maybe you've been there before. Of course I've been there before. It is. When your, you know, self-talk and your mind state is super negative, you feel like being positive is not only a chore, it's pointless. And it's not a reflection of yourself. Like it's not, you know, because if you're really feeling bad, like you know, it's like, oh, it's, it's fake to like be nice to people. And people who are in a good mood just feel like I'm sincerely happy and I want to share positivity with people. So when I say people who are coming at me are negative, it's like, well, that's just a reflection of your mind state in most people. You know, you're being neg negative because you feel negative. I wanted to use this as an example of like behind every hater. So this is for you. If you ever have haters, like just know. So I go, to, I be, get combative with my haters, but some of them break down and actually admit like, yeah, I was in the wrong. I was doing it because of this. And I applaud anyone who does because it takes self-awareness and like dropping your ego for a second to actually admit the truth as I'm pointing it out. And all I'm doing is going, I'm not saying you're stupid and you're ugly and this, I'm just going, how do you think your, your behavior looks to the outside world? While it's unfortunate that he was sort of kicked while he's down, at the same time, you know, that allows me to be sincere with him and say, hey, look, if you wanted to talk to me, if you wanted to interact with me, if you were trying to be funny or whatever, like you could do that in other ways. I can try to help you. Do you need somebody to talk to? Do you need advice with fitness if you have an injured back? I would like to be able to do that for you. The lesson here is don't go about it in that way. And that is a sign of immaturity. And I think a lesson that if, if your instinct is to do that, maybe you do need to learn that lesson. And if it brought you to the point where you realize that's the wrong way to go about things, good. It's painful, but it's a good lesson. Um, and everybody needs a little pain in their lives to learn things, don't we? Don't we need a little pain? to learn things. So this has a happy ending. I think we're going to be cool with each other. I think I'm going to talk to this kid, but just let it be a lesson to you that behind every hater telling you're an insecure little triggered bitch and you suck at everything and I'm in your head, this is what I'm talking about. It's projection and sometimes they will just fully admit it and it's glorious because all my haters really hate themselves, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got another champion of the week with my good friend, writer, director, and so many more things, Nick Ritchie. How you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me here. So, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad you you could make it. You're a busy man, so I'm glad we found uh, a little time. 
the reason I wanted to have you on now, somebody had commented on your page. You just finished this this movie, One Eight Hundred Hot Night. Yeah. You know, which was an amazing script, and the production went well. Yeah, right? it went really great. Yeah. 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 And so this guy, because they, he's like following or hating on me, goes to your page under the poster and is like, "Because you and Mark are friends, I'm not going to watch this movie." And like was just like, "Fuck you." And I'm like, if you only knew, like. <laughs> Nick's reputation amongst people, like you don't have any enemies, like you're not like a, you know, you're just like people like Nick Ritchie, love the guy, super hardworking, like all he does is come up with amazing, you know, ideas and execute them, and you're out here like you know giving people work as a writer director, and so I just thought it was hilariously ironic and I had to bring you on to like showcase, like this is the guy who you're saying fuck you if you've never met him before, right? Uh, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, that was kind of su surprising, you know. I I I uh, yeah, I had to. Had to block that person just because, like, oh man, I can't have that kind of negativity right now in my right. head. You know, yeah, I'm insecure enough. Isn't it? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, no, no, it was it was kind of a funny. Uh, it was a funny thing because I obviously am a fan of you in general, and Mark's my champion of the week. In case any of you know, this is <laughs> <laughs> this is a champion reversal here. Oh shit! Oh my god! <laughs> I just champion reversed. Wow. Uh, uh, no, but but you know, I always am trying to like surround myself with doers and people that are uh, that I get inspired by, and. You, you, you know, like guys like Mark, who we've collaborated before in the past. And, and I like watching your journey and, and other collaborators and friends of my journey. And so I always feel like that's a positive thing. Like I, I want to be surrounded by people in my life that are, are, uh, reaching out and say, how are you? Yeah. Hey, that's great. You know, well, yeah. I'm happy for you. you know? Yeah. Because you're relentlessly positive, like, the, you know, and not that you never experience anger or anything, but like, I've just known you to be somebody who prioritizing prioritizes communicating in a positive way and trying to be self-aware about your own negative emotions yeah. when they come up and to not let that affect other people. You're, you're very much not petty. Or if you ever do anything, like you'll have open conversations with me about like, oh, this really upset me and it made me think about this and I almost did that, but you'll catch yourself, right? And, and let me just back up a little because yeah. we know each other. We first met in 2007. I had written a script with Tony, our mutual friend, Tony O'Brien, right out of college. Um, and you played a very important role in the movie, which was the best friend of the lead. And it was actually written as like a fat guy, right? <laughs> yeah. Now you gained a little bit of weight for it. You were fat, but like you were very perfect for it. So I was like very grateful. Like you came in and really killed this like dramatic role that needed you to be like fun, friendly, goofy, but then kind of like serve as, you know, this, this, turn for the audience to see like things are getting really bad in this movie because your character is starting to like be impacted by it so uh, we we connected right off that and have since like worked on scripts together we've written music together uh you uh everybody check out thickest thieves with nick ritchie i always pass your music out to people um he has some really original rap rock i guess you'd say that you know still i'll pass it on to people like check this out people still enjoy it so even though the band is no longer <laughs> the music lives on you can check out the, the music lives on. but what you have been doing you know your entire time when i met you you'd already been writing scripts right yeah yeah and you you know i don't know if i've read your very first scripts like now i know you're just like a highly competent screenwriter but you yourself say they all suck Right, or you would say like, yeah, you I know, sure I wasn't good. I through a couple of full scripts that took me like two years to write away. Like in the garbage. garbage. Yeah. I, I couldn't find them. Yeah. If you asked me to, they're gone. Yeah. yeah, but that's sort of the norm, isn't it? For most yeah. people. Yeah. It's yeah. just like you, you. many people don't progress past that or or think like they need validation from, from this. Now, as a guy who I'd say more than almost any other person um, that I've known in LA, you seek out honest feedback. You'll send me drafts, and I could say anything to you. Yeah. And like, you, you know, yeah. it's never like, oh, look, look how good it is. You're like, say whatever you want, and I actually do feel comfortable yeah. telling you things that I don't like. It's just like, nowadays, a lot, you'll send me stuff, and it's like, yeah, I don't really have a lot to add. You're really good at this now, <laughs> like, you, you know. Um, so tell me about, like, your mindset to, like, for example, screenwriting, because I think that's one of the toughest yeah. things. Like, you're not getting validation ever. You have to finish this whole thing and then send it out. Yeah. How have how did you stay with that from, you know, the early 2000s to where you're at now as a writer-director actually making movies? I think, like, we were just talking about this before we started the segment. of the, yeah. There's this book called Grit that I, I've recommended to Mark, and, yeah. I, and I know you're going to listen to it, and it's great. But it talks about this idea of, like, it's not enough to just practice something, right? Because if you just practice, like, if Michael Phelps... Uh, I'll back it up. Like, 
he basically says, or she says in this book, like the word talent is is sort of a dismissive word to say someone's talented. The talent, yeah. what does that mean, talent? Like yeah. talented is in they've got like long arms. Is that talent? That's <laughs> genetics, right? So that's not right. talent. So talent is developed over time through deliberate practice. And this idea that like deliberate practice isn't just showing up. If you're a hundred meter sprinter yeah. and you just naturally can run 11-2, well, that's not going to get you very far, right? Yeah. That's fast. It's lightning fast to the regular yeah. person, but 11-2 is not going to get you very far. So you have yeah. to show up and try to run 11-1. And then once you hit 11-1, you got to get 11-0. And yes. then eventually you got to get, and nowadays you got to get down to like 9.9. .9. <laughs> it sounds crazy. Yeah. I don't even know what it is to compete. And so the point is that if you're not doing deliberate practice to get better, then you, you, you don't have the grit. You're not going to make it. And so I was really just felt like I was the staying in it was competing against myself. And yeah. so there were little things I could do to, for deliberate practice. Like it wasn't just about, let me write the next screenplay. Yeah. It was, okay, can I expand my vocabulary? Is that a weapon mm -hmm. I can use to become a better writer? So I subscribed to a website, get, get a free plug here for membean.com. <laughs> 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 like high schoolers use it you yeah. know, now to study for SATs. And so yeah. I started doing mem bean daily, 15 minutes every day to learn new words. <laughs> yeah. and, and, but it's and this little tangible thing. Little tangible thing that I knew like 15 minutes every day, I can potentially become a better writer. Not saying yeah. that guaranteed, but I could yeah. potentially. And, and I noticed then, that in your scripts, like you rarely use the same word twice. I try to not uh, uh, um, repeat myself, then surrounding myself with other writers. So that yeah. was what you just said. Like, Yeah, we, you uh, would organize a, a writer's group, yeah, you know, yeah. as much as possible, like sometimes weekly, sometimes you take a break from it, but like, you know, it, it, it's a lot of energy to organize something like that. Yeah. But, but it really, like, that's a can be a big help to people. A big help because I had people like you and other writers who were in this group, and we would meet, you know, weekly or biweekly or whatever it was, and you're getting feedback right there and people pushing you. And so I think it was just that, like, okay, I got this next script done. And there, and by the way, there's these there's sort of these beacons along the way, right? I, I, mm -hmm. I was listening to, like, a Morgan Freeman interview once, and he was talking about how, so someone said like, oh man, you've never stopped working. Or when you did, you know, it was just these little bits. He was, you know, you just had this great career. And he said, yeah. dude, I've, st I, there's been times where I wasn't hired and I almost gave up. This is Morgan yeah. Freeman saying this, like yeah. I almost gave up on my career, but then something would happen. It was like the equivalent of I'd fallen down in a crowd and some person decided to pick me up, grab my arms and like put me back on my feet. Yeah. And I think I've had those moments with yeah. friends yeah. who said like, hey, this is really great. Keep going. Or yeah. or a script gets optioned and even though it yeah. didn't get made. Because you've, like, you've, you've placed or won in competitions before. Yeah. This is like way before I think anything was made. But like, yeah, because I was always looking at you like, yeah, you're definitely on the right path. And I mean, I, I just don't think people grasp like the difficulty and odds of screenwriting specifically. Like oh, everybody yeah. has this like, I'm going to be the next Diablo Cody and write <laughs> Juno and win an academy. It's like, Oof, it's so doesn't happen like that, you know, one in a million times maybe. Yes. But like the grind and the, again, because you're working alone, you yeah, know, yeah, and the feedback, yeah. it's not like, you know, other things where you have more of an instant gratification, like even st stand up comedy super hard, but it, like you can at least go and hear some laughs, you know, That's right. on a nightly basis. And, and I just always think of screenwriting as like most people just don't, when it come, push comes to shove, you're alone doing it. Yeah, and, and even in another, t taking that step further, screenwriting is one of the only art forms that requires another art form for completion. Right. So, like, yeah. you can write a, if someone, if you were a poet, and Mark yeah. Harley says, oh, I'm a poet, I write books of poetry, that's it. You write yeah. the poetry, you can, that's the end game, yeah. is having written the poetry. Yeah. The end game for screenwriting isn't to write the script. The end game is to make the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and that's an additional difficult step. Yeah. And there was this legendary producer who passed away, um, amazing guy. And I used to serve eggs at this restaurant in Malibu when I first moved to LA. And yeah. I, I let him read one of my early scripts. And he was one of those guys that kind of picked me up and said, like, you've got, there's some promise here, you know, keep going. Yeah. And I remember he said to me, the hardest thing to do in this business is write a good script. And he said, the second hardest thing to do in this business is write a bad script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. And he was just kind of Because it saying, doesn't, yeah. I mean, I was, like, you know, you, you put your heart and soul into the ones that, you know, you ended up throwing away, I'm sure. Yeah, know? yeah. It's just at that time, you didn't two have Two years of set. work? Yeah. You know, for like, me, I, you know, for a thing that you, at the time, were really passionate about. Yeah. And you have to also be okay with, I mean, man, I've been on the floor, busted up, feeling like I need to quit. And, you know, just from a script, you know, maybe getting picked up by a studio 
right. then me thinking, oh, it's going to go. I'm going to have this TV series. Yeah. And then you feel like you got like this close and it just falls apart. Right. Yeah. Because that, that was another thing I wanted to mention is like, it isn't just like you've had, you've had a, you know, a great progression skill wise that I can watch, but also you've had a lot of like, like excitement where, you know, if a script gets optioned or bought by a network or a production company, like I've seen you go through these things and then maybe one little like accidental thing. Remember the, the SAG contract thing with Tommy, like where it's like, oh, this guy isn't, or WGA or like, there was something about a contract that was off and like, it, it just like these random things that like, it's a mistake. And then it's like, we're not doing the project anymore. Yeah. And you're like, what the, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. but you know, you have shown me so much resilience as far as going moments like that yeah. were like something crumble, like this big opportunity that you weren't deluding yourself into thinking it's going to happen. It's like going into production, you know, and things can happen to take that all away from you, but you don't give up. Yeah. Right. You yeah. don't let that defeat or deflate you. Whereas frankly, I think many people would just be like, take that as a sign. Like this isn't for me or something. Right. Yes. Like yes. Or they're, just, they're so like you can become bitter by those moments. Yeah. Oh, you can yeah. Become and, and demotivated. I've, I've almost had those moments where I've yeah. gotten bitter, and and also you know, because sometimes, like you said, it's it's sort of this lone wolf career path, right? Of right. So you just don't really know. Like, is this thing good? And you're yeah. sitting there with something. Is it good? And 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 maybe you send a project out and nobody wants it. And I mean, I've straight up had, you know, my own representation tell me. I'll give them a script and go, nah, nothing can be done with this. Yeah. And then I go, okay, well, I just spent, you know, whatever, 18 yeah. months developing this thing. And then I take it out and it sells like three weeks later. Right. And I go, well, if I had listened to the, the professionals, right. I wouldn't have sold this show yeah. or sold this now, thing. And, and you've given me examples of that too. Like, so I know some specific like pitches or scripts that you're like, my management wasn't excited about it. And I'm like, are they blind? Like, like <laughs> I've read it and I think it's amazing. It's creative and it's so good. And if you didn't have like, you know, some sort of core belief in yourself, moments like that where you're going, well, this this is the expert, right? Telling me that, that I'm wrong about this. And I, I think that's also just a lesson in, you know, the hateration where it's yeah. like, yeah, man, sometimes there's legitimate critiques, but sometimes like you do have to just go, cool, thank you for your opinion, moving on, you know? Yes. And, and sometimes that really pays off because you can't assume that everyone around you, you is looking out for your best interest or can even like understand what's in your best interest. Oh man, I, I think I think ninety percent of people we encounter are afraid. Yeah, afraid of something in general. Yeah. Afraid of losing their job at the yeah. studio they work at or the yeah. network they work yeah. out. Because these concepts are like when I think of the ones they're original, right? So yes. you have really yeah. original ideas that aren't like they're really well executed. But it's like you can't be like, oh, it's just like Ozarks, but this or something. Like there's not an easy that's right. comparison, perhaps, and that's probably what leads people to go, I can't do anything with it. Yeah, because you're limited, you know, in your capacity to like imagine how to pitch it, right? That's right. Yes, yes. And, and it is, you know, you essentially have to go create one fan and then another fan and then yeah. another fan yeah. uh, um, and, and, and then hope that that sort of grows and you sort of get what's, they say like a thousand hardcore fans equals a critical tribe essentially. Yeah. Which you have on the show. Hey! Right? <laughs> no, but it matters. Like yeah. if you, get, you have over a thousand subscribers, that's sort of what they consider that critical mass of, and how do you do that on screenplays? Right. You yeah, no, like, it's one of the toughest <laughs> things. You know, it's, it is one of the toughest things. And I just, you know, before we ended, I want to touch on some things because, like, I think if people met you, like, but this is the case with, like, Chappelle, you, some other people that I've become close with over the years, like, they're these really positive people who just, like, move forward and, like, are on top of their shit. And I don't know what you would assume from that, but sometimes it can be easy to forget that, like, you know, you've come from a sort of dark place, right? Yeah, like yeah. growing up, your family, you there was addiction in your family, um, poverty, like you grew, you like kind of describe yourself as like a bad kid. You got into fights, you were like stealing, like all this stuff. So yeah. you came from this dark place. And like, you know, I think that helps me appreciate like you're such a positive person who who really values like kindness and and uh you know having a, a strong moral compass so can you talk about that like coming from a place like that and like you know what that makes you value as an adult yeah i think like also just seeing some of the people i grew up around and and including in my own family and like seeing how their lives got destroyed by yeah. different things whether it was addiction alcoholism or, or whatever drugs um crime yeah. uh and there's a part of that that's alluring, right? Because you want to be a part of that and you want to be tough and whatever, you know, so you can go get in some scraps and realize, oh, yeah, I can throw hands. Like, I can yeah. do this, you know. Uh, but then there's the other side of us. Well, like, their life got taken away or I, you see a, a cousin or an uncle go to prison for a decade yeah. or something. And I started to, I think back then, even at a young age, at 13, 14, I was like, I'm not going to be that. 
Yeah. I'm not, I, under no circumstances am I going to be that. Like, I won't even let myself get addicted to caffeine. Like, if I drink uh, yeah. iced tea for three months, I'll stop for a month just to prove to myself I don't have an addiction issue yeah. or something, you know? Uh, yeah. So, obviously, it's a little, maybe a little yeah. too far. But my point is that, that, like, I think eventually I just found that my, my marching orders for myself were just to go out and do things I love, be good to people. And that, that yeah. like, maybe that would come back. And there's, again, there's, Another, not to throw another book at you, but like there was a point where I read this book called The Go Giver. And it talked about like this idea of going out into the world. And if Mark Harley comes to me and says, Hey, man, I need this or this, you know, assuming it doesn't hurt me, give it to him. Right. Go help that yeah. person. Help that person. Not like just so that. you can get help back, yeah. but you will learn through the process of helping them how to better yourself or how to take that into the next project. So I just try to live by that. And it's fulfilling for me. Yeah. It's fulfilling for me when I'm failing or when things yeah. aren't going well that I can fall back on that. Cause if you're generally, and I don't, I don't know how else to describe this kind of a miserable person or someone who seeks out strife. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Then you're always going to have that strife or something. So when something goes wrong, the whole world collapses where I feel right. like if something goes wrong, I got this whole foundation of amazing people and I'm bragging about my friends and that's no, no testament to me, just about yeah. the people I'm surrounded by that I know will just catch me. Right. You know, no, so I, like, I really love that attitude and that that analogy and that approach to life because it is something like, I don't know if I'd thought about it in such clear terms, but like, it's just something I saw my dad do and other people that I admire where I'm like, yeah, if it doesn't take, you know, I'll talk to you online or whatever, people like who reach out because it doesn't cost me anything. If it's not hurting me, I'm going to try to do it. And that's like kind of, you know, partially based on, I'd hope that other people around me have the same approach, yeah. you know, the same attitude. So. We've been talking a lot. I want to have you on for a full, you know, yeah, hour yeah, length interview at some point. But for now, I'm just going to plug your first movie, Lolo, Nick Ritchie. Yeah. Um, N I C K R I C H E Y. Did I spell it correctly? You did. Okay. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, impressed. N Ritchie eight at, at Instagram. Um, your first movie, Lolo, really love it. Super original, amazing. And your new movie is going to be coming out soon. It's called One Eight Hundred Hot Night. N I T E. N I T E. Yeah. yeah. One Eight Hundred Hot Night. It's it's also on Instagram. But again, we're just, we're in the post production process mm -hmm. and very excited about it and kind of loosely. It was really great script. Yeah, really thanks, fun movie. Thanks, I think thanks. so. Yeah, I'm excited and and uh, just appreciate you uh, bringing me on here, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bro. Thanks for coming on, bro. Right, yeah. Hell yeah! Wow, I can't believe you're still here and that you made it through the entire episode. I just want to say, if you like this protein pancake recipe. I want to see your pancakes that you make in a video of you eating them, okay? Let's hashtag it protein pancake fetish. Put it online, DM it to me. We're going to play some of it. Make it seductive, right? Make it sexy. I'll see you next week.